Aloha, and welcome to another episode of the Ground Soul Origins Podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. Today, we had Sunny Dublick on the call, and uh, this session was incredibly interesting for me because it was a fellow brand strategist, uh, someone who was bantering with me about like just absolutely giving you a deep dive in what's going on right now with brand strategy. But even more, I didn't even realize that we were going to get into this, but branding and, and AI, where this intersection is and, and sort of how to create a point of view. So Sunny is just like an incredible background in brand research, brand audits, working with clients, especially in B2B brand strategy. And we just have such an engaging conversation about brands. So if you're looking to get up to on what's going on in now with what's really current with branding and what's going to be sustainable, you're going to be wanting to listen in. So without further ado, let's paddle in. All right, let's paddle in. Welcome to the show, Sunny Dublick. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. I'm really stoked that you're here and I'm really excited to be talking about branding, marketing, strategy, brand audit, research, and uh, maybe give everybody just a quick little background of, um, you know, what brought you to doing branding and brand strategy and those sort of things. Sure. Um, so I am an accidental entrepreneur. I got laid off of my last kind of corporate marketing gig and it was the greatest opportunity because I had realized, like, I always loved what I did. I loved marketing. It was fun. It was creative. Um, I just never really loved like the business aspect of who I was doing it for. Um, so being able to branch out on my own was really exciting because it allowed me to do the thing that I love for really cool. I met so many amazing people in the process, but I love that it's an art and a science, right? Like there's the cool kind of nerdy metrics part of me, but then I'm also an artist. I've always been very creative and I love that you can kind of blend the two together. It's something that's constantly evolving. Um, and yeah, it's just been something I've fallen in love with over the years. So That's interesting. You'd say you're an artist because when we talked, we talked quite a bit about um, analytics and research. Where does that come from? Um, so I loved, uh, Sailor Moon when I was in middle school and I used to doodle her and the Powerpuff Girls in like every one of my notebooks. And then sometime in my twenties, I kind of just picked it up again. I was like, God, I used to love drawing. So I picked up painting. It was just a cold, I used to live in Philadelphia. It was super cold winter. There was nothing to do. It got dark so early. So I started taking painting classes and then it just kind of evolved and progressed from there. I'm actually like, Everything in the room where I'm at is all my paintings everywhere. So it's the thing that keeps me sane, basically. <laughs> but, but 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 if you're an artist like you, um, when we talked, we were talking a lot about research and research methodology. That almost is like right brain, left brain. That's like, you know, a little counter to being an artist. Like, where does that come from? I'm a Gemini. It's a little a little column A, a little column B. Um, I think they actually both feed each other in the right like circumstances. So if I am super bogged down with like data and research and all of that, like the reason that lights me up is because it allows me to be creative and implement creative strategies and then vice versa. Like even when I'm painting, there's a lot of really highly analytical things that need to go into it in order to make it the pretty picture that it is. Um, so I actually think that they're both very complementary skills to each other. And if I get too far in, you know, either one of them, it kind of is easy to get bored when you mix them together. I think that's something that's always been really kind of fascinating to me. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I started my career in um, completely measurement driven. Uh, you know, I my my agency I had SDMG. It was called Strategic Direct Marketing Group. I mean, those of you that listen to the podcast, you've probably heard it before. But it's everything we did was measurement only. We, in fact, that was uh, if we couldn't measure it, we wouldn't do it. And, and if, and usually brands came to us going, we want to figure out how to measure our billboards or our, our ads and things of that nature. And so we would integrate, you know, uh, response mechanisms, contests, um, uh, you know, trackable things to be able to measure it and stuff. And I did that for years and I found it to be quite a uh, limiting. Um, I, you know, I was really enamored with it because I felt like I was doing right by the client because everything was evidence driven. But I knew there was something more that was left on the table for growth. And when I left SDMG, I started going in the freeway, uh, the the sort of the lane way of, of content marketing. And at the core, what I've recognized for myself is, you can see from the back there, I, I'm an artist too. And and I sort of, I kind of fell in back into being a little bit more of an artist in my marketing. And that's where brand fits in. Is like, I think that's what we share is this intersection of like logical thinking and strategic thinking meets art. Very creative thinking. And when people think creative, they think it's crayon drawing. 
It's not. It's actually, I think it's like so much more. I read a post that you wrote about creative thinking. I want to share a little bit about like what, what does that mean to you anyways when you think about being a creative? It's, it's like, I think it's a big distinction. People put creative and artists in the same category and it's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, it's funny because I think about this all the time. Almost everybody that I know, like friend, family member, colleague, if I talk to anything, like anything gets mentioned about painting, they look at it and like, oh, I could never do that. I'm not creative. And it's one of those things that just drives me crazy because it's like, that's a, one of those beliefs that we tell ourselves because we haven't flexed that muscle. So when I think like, you know, when you're in kindergarten, nobody thinks I'm not creative, right? You're just doing because you're not afraid to mess up. Um, You're not afraid of what the output is, right? You're not afraid to be laughed at. And I think it's just one of those things where if you've spent the amount of time, effort and energy that I have on painting and drawing and all of that, and like just constantly feeding that and trying to get better over the years, you would be just as good at this in your own kind of style, unique style. So I think being a creative is one of those things where I think it's just opening up yourself to it's not just I'm looking at the information in front of me. It's also I'm listening to my intuition. I'm listening to my gut. I'm um, trying to think outside the box of it's not just an A or a B type solution. And I think there's so many limiting beliefs that people have of like, oh, I'm an accountant. I can't be creative. Like even accountants are creative. You have to find creative ways sometimes of, you know, pulling from this and, and putting here. So I think it's just um, it's safe to not feel creative. It's um, actually quite scary at times to share your creativity with the world because it's not always going to be accepted. And I think that's where it's easier to fall into like, I've been reading a lot about left brain, right brain, um, kind of the left brain being that rational, they call it the bully brain. Um, And I've actually started this exercise that in the morning you write down three pages. It's from the artist way. I don't know if you've Mm -hmm. ever heard of it. I know it. Yeah, yeah. So the whole premise is that you need to set yourself up to receive. Um, You have to kind of empty out all of the things that the left brain is trying to take over of, I need my coffee. Here's my to-do list. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. all of those things need to get out so that your right brain has the space to take over and do its thing. So I need that on this stuff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, totally. Like creativity is, you know, I like the way you were kind of describing that. The word I'd replace for people listening that say, well, I'm not really a creative. I'd say, what about being, are you resourceful? Because that mm. is being creative. It's like finding, identifying resources. And I like how you mentioned intuition. You know, I did a podcast with uh, Guru Singh and we did a, at length talking about gut intelligence. And um, I think when you're talking about that discomfort people feel about sharing creativity, I think it's because our the bias of the cultural field of business and marketing has been show me the results. Mm. And and it's easy to wave that flag and everybody goes, no results, then it's just all speculation. Not true. That's where I realized that I was so focused on the data side, the real unhidden growth that I was seeing was brands that didn't weren't so in they it's not that they didn't they didn't um, pay attention to, to uh, research or data driven is that they also equally went on tuition creativity. And that's where you see these incredible growth opportunities when you kind of lean into both. And it's really difficult because right now it's not popular to say that Um, you're, Mm. you're kind of like, well, you're just saying that to be non-accountable to your results. And I'd say, well, go look at the results of businesses that actually act and do in this way. So um, growth hackers have this framework called ice impact, confidence, and ease by Sean Ellis, Hacking Growth. He was on my podcast. He wrote the book. And it's like about, identi- it's like, what's the impact on my, on my outcome? Am I confident in what's the ease? And that's how you do your marketing experience. That's very much, um, um, you know, a logical side of your brain. And what I've done is I've adapted to go, well, also consider identity, congruency, and energy. Does this fit the identity of your brand, your business, or yourself? Is it congruent with your values or the kind of business you have? And do you have the energy for it? That If I said to most executives, hey, do you have the energy for it? They go, what's that got to do with actually doing a branding or marketing exercise? And I'd say it's everything. Because mm-hmm. if you aren't excited about doing it, if you're not excited about your brand, it's not going to work. If, I mean, I don't know what your experience has been, but for me, it's really important to get buy-in at, these, at the identity, congruency, and energy level. And no one's really talking about it. So I'm trying to like, almost like talk a little bit more, take that rational thinking to creativity to help people understand that it is, it is a fucking X factor for growth. Yeah. I think too, like one of the things, and you've alluded to it and like, I couldn't agree more is like 
we've become so data dependent and I understand obviously we need to pro- like provide the return on investment and all of that. But you contrast that with what we know is that people like to hear stories. People like to feel impact, right? The content that makes sense to someone that matters, that really uh, gets someone attached to a brand isn't in those like fine detailed metrics So it's like, I feel like there's like two sides of the coin where a hundred percent you want to be able to prove like I spent X, I got X in return. It makes sense logically, but not all marketing can be logical. Just like not all things in life are exactly logical. So um, especially in light, I mean, I was doing kind of uh, annual reporting for one of my clients and in light of everything that's happened with iOS, I mean, I'm going through a lot of things in analytics that a lot of it is just like, we can't find this data. Like I no longer have all of the information about my customer demographics and all of that due to privacy regulations. So I think that there's been such a like data, data, data. We're making all of our decisions with data. And you're right. Like so much of the fun has been squeezed out of brands of like, what about the stuff that lights people up? What about the stuff that's like softer metrics? What about the stuff that gets us excited internally? Um, And there has to be space for that. I really do believe there has to be a balance, just like there's a left brain, right brain balance. There has to be a balance in brands as well. You know, I I feel like I'm an owner advocate. Like I really understand the angst that someone feels about listening to this. And there there's a part of them that's going, this just sounds like justification for creative gobbledygook. And and this is my thought is it the reason why is because those metrics are applied to short term thinking. Mm. It's like you're applying it to a campaign level of thinking. If and and the reason why is that your, your KPIs haven't been properly matched to a longer term ROI. And the reason why you're unwilling to do it is you didn't play it through or you don't believe it could happen. So, you know, it's just that Tony Robbins business master. And he goes, he tells a story about this guy that, that was looking for treasure for 30 years. And um, you can imagine for 30 years, he didn't find anything. How did he continue? He ended up, he ended up scoring the largest treasure uh, underwater treasure in the world of, of all time. And, he had to believe three things. One was, is that the treasure was there. Two is to believe that he could get, he could actually reach the treasure and that it was worth it. And I think that is it worth it and that you can get there is the problem that most marketers and branding uh, people have a challenge with. That's why I like the idea of like the integration, because if you can help owners understand that they just need to know that they can get there and it's worth it, the measurement stick could change and they could actually act like create exponential growth because of the type of marketing that the storytelling and community and things that don't have that rapid metric, like a, a quick uptake on an ad or something. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I know that when you and I are talking about, you know, um, doing audits, do you also like, do you, how do you navigate that with, with clients to kind of get them to think a little differently? Because that is data driven when you start with that, with an analytic audit, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that I really love, um, I read your book, Groundswell, which I loved, but you you. talk about this, that a lot of people don't have and its patience because you really do have to be able to plant the seeds and watch them grow. Like everyone that I've worked with, and I'm sure you found this too. It's like, when is it going to kick in? When is it going to start? We've been doing this for two months. It's not working yet. Is it working yet? And you could say that though, about anything in life, like dating, finding a job, like when you're like on top of it, like, when is it going to come here? When is it going to come? That's not when it gets there. So I think one of the things that I do is I can present you. So when I do a brand audit for someone, I am giving them the picture of this is who you told me you are and what you want, like goal wise. This is everything that I'm seeing and like how it's kind of measuring up. And here's everything that I'm going to recommend as an outcome of that. And when I'm recommending those outcomes, like I like to give the premise, I'm not going to tell you that I have like the magic, like tomorrow you're going to all of a sudden get an extra million dollars from doing X, Y, and Z. I really like to lead them to this is a slow burn and it's not just on marketing. I think that's one of the things that's really frustrating for a lot of business owners. They assume you hire a marketing department, they do your marketing and it's done. It has to be an entire business moving together. Um, So it's when you get the combined, like I, you know, Joe Captain America with our powers combined, when everyone really is like bought in on the same team, we're moving towards this goal together. When we're in the trenches and things aren't going so well, we still have the resilience of knowing where we're going and feeling really sound. And this is right for us. 
Because again, that's like all things in life. It's like tried and tested over time. And then you're going to get there. I don't think I've ever seen any strategy that's like up, 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 and like no downside to it. You have to be really rooted in, and I think that's why strategy is so important, who you are, who you're doing this for, and why. And when you are, it's so much easier to like kind of navigate that together. You know, it's like the analogy of of bamboo. Bamboo Mm -hmm. spends 80% of its growth in its roots first, but yet it's the fast, considered the fastest growing plant in the world. It grew its roots first and you can't even see it before it's about to grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's a tough one for businesses because unfortunately, I think there's been a lot of, um, um, I'd say a lot of charlatans in marketing branding or the business itself wouldn't play through the strategy or there's no integration. And I think you said something really valuable. It's not the marketing team that should be showing up. The real brand is actually how you deliver it and what people say when you're not there comes down to the culture, the innovation, actually the product delivery and the promise you make. And that is where, that's where I think where branding kind of supersedes marketing. I think when people think branding, they think branding and marketing are the same and working with the strategist like yourself, it's way beyond marketing. I mean, it's what drives marketing that should be an immovable object. So talk a little bit about that differentiation in your mind and the way you communicate it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I think when I first started in my career, I was very timid. And I never wanted to say anything that could piss anybody off. Yeah. And luckily, I luckily I've shook that habit. But <laughs> because my job right now is to tell you the truth. But um, I think that when it comes to branding and marketing, like they're they are so entirely different. The way that you need to think about them is really different. And what's important for us to remember is like one of the things I always want to go back to is the product or the service. And a lot of times people don't like that. They come to me and they're like, "We want you to market this," and I'm like, "Well." part of my job is also to audit the thing that I'm selling because marketing used to be, here's the shiny object, go get sales from it. Um, you know what I mean? Like be the, be the voice, like the communication method, et cetera, to get this out there. And that's not it anymore. Like for me, marketing encompasses all of that. Marketing encompasses me saying, Hey, your customers need this and the product doesn't offer this because when you're setting yourself up for sustainable long-term growth in business, You want something that ultimately is going to grow and evolve with your customers. Otherwise, it's not going to exist. So I think the branding aspect of things is really how I like to do what I call the blind brand test with people. Oh, what's that? And it's if I took your the brand, like the logo away, and I'll show them competitor messages. Can you tell me if this is yours or theirs? And that's one of the things where it's like, it's not you. We're all saying the same thing. We're all in this kind of pool together, right? And so it's like, that's the marketing is like that message that communicates it. But ultimately that always is going to come back to that foundation of who we are as a brand. And is this who we really like think we are, say we were, we say we are, et cetera. But it's always fun because it's like um, doing the Coca-Cola and uh, Pepsi test. When people are like, oh, you know, people even that work for Coca-Cola, I'm sure are like, I can, I can taste my own, you know, brands. And sometimes they can't. And so for me, it's one of those things that really helps us understand, like, just why that brand is so integral in the grand scheme of things. And especially, obviously, depending on the industry and all of that. But like, if you want to win long term, you have to have that solid foundation and that branding first. There's like that brand strategy, that whole underlying what I call like the bedrock And then above that is your marketing plan. Like above that is like kind of, here's all the tactics of how we communicate that. But when you're rooted in your brand, it's so much easier to say yes or no to marketing. Um, So if someone comes around and says, we need a TikTok, you can automatically say, if you know who you are in your brand, I don't need that. That's not for us. That's not who we want to talk to, right? It just becomes so much easier to understand yourself. It's like knowing thyself um, versus knowing how to present yourself to the world. Oh, you just gave a little gold there. So the gold that I <laughs> took from there in that is, and I agree, is in well done brand strategy actually decreases decision making time. Yes. Right. And so yes. if you don't know what you stand for, you don't know what you're up against, you don't know what your values are, when you come up against do we do this? Do we market in this channel? Do we whatever those decisions are, and you zigzag all around, that's what creates these sort of schizophrenic brands that you see out there that are not even a brand. They're just like, like marketing, uh, you know, random acts of marketing more than anything else. Right. And so to make it cohesive and to feel that there's some congruency is when you have that clarity, you're able to go in a direction and people can follow, understand, and then trust it. Really. That's what it comes down to is a level of trust. And yeah. so when you're talking about um, also, you made another little nugget there, which I picked up on, which was the product. 
most people that, you know, this is something I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but I think this is one of the biggest um, limitations for maybe a lot of people. If you're listening and you're thinking of working with brand strategists and you don't like what you're hearing, you're probably talking to the right person. As soon as, as soon as you're hearing somebody that's just making it agreeable, I think that you're not being challenged enough to become remarkable at the at the core of what you're delivering. Because if you were remarkable, you wouldn't want you would, wouldn't need anybody. There's this great quote: "Marketing and advertising is tax you pay for being unremarkable." The whole job that you and I do is to help people become remarkable, to challenge them to become something more than in the mind of their clients that they don't even want to. They don't even, don't even need any marketing. Right. Yeah. I mean, yep. that's pretty. I mean, it's a pretty big, bold statement, but that does exist. Yep. I think too. What's really interesting is there's uh, there's often pushback that I get when I work with people. I get very commonly, I just need you to do this one marketing thing for me, ah. and, and it's, it's you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, it's I know off. exactly yep. what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and what I what I challenge <laughs> them with is I say that's like me going to a doctor's office and saying I need open heart surgery and I've never had a scan. And I was like, what my value is and what you should really want is to know what you're doing right, what you need to be doing, because if not, you're going to get sucked into these kind of rabbit holes that a lot of digital marketing is now. And some of it is working to various degrees of efficacy, but a lot of it is just they'll sell you on social media or ads or emails. And that's what people think marketing is now. And like, those are just like little tactics that are like, you shouldn't even be thinking about those right now. Because again, that's how you get the shiny object sy- syndrome of going, I need to try this. I need to try this. And you're not waiting for anything to pay it's off. You're not food. sure if it's working. Yes, exactly. It's so much junk food. So what I like to do and the way I like to frame it is that what I'd really love, and a lot of the companies that I work with are B2B, um, I want to talk to your clients. And more importantly, I want to talk to the people that have passed on your business. Because for me, what's going to happen is it's going to be less about marketing. It's more about how they perceive your brand and why they said yes or no to what it is you have to offer. Because any business owner that you talk to is going to be so excited about what they've built, and they should be, right? If not, why are you doing this? But what the real goal is, and I'm kind of in the process of uh, putting the finishing touches on one right now, and it's this like super complex Uh, technology product, but it's fascinating hearing people talk about the things that they won't say to a sales team. And it's fascinating to hear them give you the down low of this is my priority in my job. And this doesn't seem like it aligns with that. What I really need is this. And for me, that gives me gold that I can take to them and say, this is what people need you to build. And it's not just about taking like 60 random pieces of information and being like, do all these things for everyone. It's about finding those commonalities and things that are really in sync with who they are as a brand. So again, you know the brand, you know the customer, and like that's where things marry together from a strategy perspective. That again, in some ways goes more into business strategy than it does brand, but I think that's the value that a great brand strategist will bring to you, not just here's how you talk about yourself. How do you convince the owner or the executive team to let you talk to their their uh, customers that have left? Um. I usually frame it as if I'm going to do my best work for you, I need to fully understand like both sides of the coin. Um, I need to understand the good and the bad. And what's great is, so for in this example, this customer or this client works with some of these people in other capacities. They said no to this one offering. Um, So I was going to say, sometimes those bridges are burned and no one wants to talk to you. But the thing that's really interesting is how readily people do want to talk to me because people love to talk about themselves. And it's really easy for me to sit back and just know what questions to ask and what information I need. Um, But it's, I've never had a problem getting people to speak to me. It's usually making sure with the client that I'm getting a good mix of people. I've actually heard, and I love this, I've not done it myself, but there's a gentleman, I think he has a company based out of Seattle called Sticks. Um, He said that he likes to do, um, what does he call informant interviews? So he said at one point he had someone designing a stereo system. And obviously this was years ago, but I was was reading an interview and he said that he would talk to people that had stolen stereo systems because he wanted to know what they were looking for in a good system. What made it cool? What lights is, you know what I mean? Like all of the different bells and whistles that he would never know as he wasn't in that, you know, like like completely immersed in that industry. So again, it's just, I think, 
we lose sight of in light of all the like G4 dashboards and analytics and all this, we lose sight that we're still talking to people. Data tells you a lot about the what, it doesn't tell you a lot about the why. And that's where you just need to ask these questions. And the thing that I just want to shout from the rooftops is like people think that research has to be time consuming and super expensive and really complicated. And it doesn't have to be any of that. Like literally you can design surveys in Google Forms and just give your customers $10 off coupons and ask them the questions that you've been, you know, wanting to know. You can talk to people one-on-one. You can ask them to like, you know, is it all right if I like shadow you through the store and see what you're kind of looking at and what your thoughts are? Like, I think that customer research used to be very expensive. And there's even research now that indicates like focus groups aren't the best way to get data because they're sterile environments that people feel uncomfortable in. So Am I giving you like the world's most sound research? No. Am I giving you something that is absolutely amazing, that is giving you a ton of data that is really going to help progress your business? Yes. And so I like to start all of my strategy projects with the research component because then I can knowingly say to them, based on talking to you, your employees, your clients, this is who I know you are, not just who you say you are. It's not the strategy you think you should do that you never get to that's be a perfect strategy versus the one you can execute on now. And that is like, you're tr- totally true, right? Like you don't need to spend all that much to get that. And and there's a variety of different ways to actually make it in part of the customer experience. Like I, I was just thinking aloud myself, like, oh, you know, like if I was talking to, because um, I asked a similar type question, I got a different little example, but um, you know, you could do that as a win back strategy where it's like, we would love to have you back. Like you could make, you could, I was just thinking that as you were saying that, one of the things that, you know, when you come to me for growth marketing or back in the day when I was doing a lot of growth, growth hacking, the first question I'd ask, they go, we want to get more leads. And I go, well, why do people leave? We need to solve that first because you're right. I mean, if you don't, if you're not honest with yourself about attrition and that will give you more information than how do we just expand and market more? And frankly, the math works better. If you're going to actually proceed, wouldn't you like to know what's the leaky leak in the boat? And mm-hmm. what you can actually lean into more and move away from, and um, that will actually make it more potent. And I think that um, a lot of times executives, they shy away from it because they feel either embarrassed or they, it just, it's just not as fun as going, well, don't worry about it. We can just make, we'll just, it just sounds more exciting. And I think uh, an, an amateur marketer will just not want to do that. And I think you differentiate yourself by leaning into it and saying the hard things and sticking to it is probably it's an understated, um, you know, level of, of craftsmanship, to be honest with you. Oh, thank you. I just, one thing that I think is really funny, I say this all the time is like basic human nature. If somebody wants a product or a service, they usually do one of two things. They look it up online, probably through Google, or they ask a friend. And so when people come to me and they're like, I've spent so much money on social media advertising, that's not working and all of this. I'm like, well, Bring bring yourself back. When's the last time you brought you bought something like your product or service off of social? They're like, well, we don't. I'm like, okay, well, let's think about this then. Why aren't we going for the lower hanging fruit? Like you said, c- customer win back programs, referral programs, like things that we know work and they aren't sexy and shiny. Like let's do an Instagram strategy and reels and all of this, but they work. And like, I don't know, it's interesting just the way that people think about marketing. And it's like the thing that I tend to like, hammer home with everyone is like, don't think of it as like a digital marketing agency, because that's what everyone I that doesn't know, and isn't super well versed in marketing thinks of, like ads, emails and social, like it's so much more than that. And it's so much cooler and fun than that. Um, Even like traditional marketing, there are so many cool traditional like uh, billboards and things like that. And like, that people have done that are still cool and get a ton of awareness and engagement because you're being creative. I think people tend to just push old things aside. And now everyone's talking about metaverse and AI and all of those things. And it's like, and that's great. And there's awesome opportunities there, but never underestimate the ability of yourself to be able to use creative thinking to make something better. You can't just hop in and say, I'm doing the same thing. Everyone else is, it's going to work better. It's not, (laughs) you know, the, the sea of sameness, or where attention is, where your competitors are, part of brand positioning is going your own way mm-hmm. and not being distracted by what everyone else is doing. Like some of the, I don't, I don't believe that that some of the best brands that anyone admires, they're 
they're probably aware of their competitors, but they're not mirroring their competitors. They're, they're in fact, the reason you like them is they've kind of made a distinctive direction in their own way. And you're right. I mean, social media is there. It's a tool. And it kind of it kind of has been part of the problem because it makes everybody a marketer. And then people mm. think, if I do social media, I am doing marketing. And the, ironically, social media is becoming increasingly impotent. And, yeah. and, and it's um, um, now people are going, well, what do I do? And I think what I like about what's happening right now is the pendulum is moving in the direction of creative thinking and, and unconventional marketing. And, and it, it's, it's kind of getting to where it's a balance between some level of analytics and some level of um, good old fashioned human connection. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's, it's driving me crazy because um, there now are AI influencers on Instagram that look like humans and you don't know that they're fake, but it's going to become like a mess and it's, it's coming before we know it. And, you know, a lot of people I talk to about this, it's like you've built on rented property because at any time they could go the Twitter way where all of a sudden it's now it's $200 a month for your check mark. And, you know, one day I've always said this, I was like, I wouldn't be surprised if one day Instagram charges you as a business per post um, because they're going to need to keep the machine moving somehow. And businesses have such like a mass, such big audiences that you almost are like, you have no choice. You're obligated. So, yeah, it's like they've, they've, it's boiling the frog. It's, yeah. it's coming. It's coming, you know, and, and the AI thing, there's, a, I don't know if you knew this, there's an, there's agencies that right now you as an, as a marketing or brand, you can, you can go to the agency and they will license an AI to represent your products. It's so scary. <laughs> so what does well, that say about your brand? Yeah. What does that say about your brand? When someone goes, well, I don't need a brand strategist or even marketing messaging. I'm going to use AI. Yeah. AI is a wonderful tool. However, um, I just posted a note on, on LinkedIn today about the, it's still up in the air that the fact that, you know, AI is, is basically, um, could be up for a lot of copyright infringement. Now I don't think it's going to stop mm. AI, but I think that if you look at it just from the perspective of what do you want to be known for as a brand, how much trust does that give you? If you use some of this over technology to your brand and you don't actually make it true to the essence of who you are, the people that are there, the culture that is delivering it, the humans that are actually creating the products and so forth. And, and I think that that's going to be a big navigation for both of us in branding is helping them navigate that because the desire, the pull, the gravitational pull of AI is going to be so fucking strong. But I, yet I, I actually don't mind. You know why? Because I think the companies that focus on, on trust and human relationships, they're going to be a big differentiator. Yeah, a hundred percent. And again, like you talked about this in your book and I loved it, like the limitations of automation because everybody right now is like, let's automate, let's save money, let's cut costs. And it's like, you can only do that. Like human beings are human beings. Like they want to be, they don't want to be sold to, right? They want to have a conversation with you. And I think what the rub is, it's really interesting. Like I'll talk to people and I always ask them, what is your aspirational brand? Like, what are the brands that you want to be like? And usually Apple comes up and I wouldn't know anything about that because I'm an Android user, but regardless, I am. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. For, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> Every, everyone hates my green text messages and that's why I'll never change. Um, yeah. But I think one of the things is, are you willing to do the things that it took for them to get there, which was to be different, which was to stand apart, which was really to forge relationships, go against the grain. And again, like when it comes to the automation side of things, like I don't, that's not how I go through a sales process, right? If someone isn't willing to sit there and take the time to talk to me and not cold call and spam me, but to have like a good conversation where there's value added, then I don't want to be in the room. Like what's well, a waste of my time. And the thing now is that, like you said, everyone's a marketer, everyone's sending emails, everyone has, you know, social media book ads and posts going up. People are just filtering that out. And I think the same is going to happen with AI. I think it's going to be like ad blockers. Um, and again, who knows what the what the future brings, but people want to Here's buy from people. Mark Schaefer made a prediction, and I would yeah. agree with it. He thinks the next biggest social channel is going to be an AI a, a filter. You, there's no way, no AI of any kind, any conversation, any it'll have filter out anything AI, and it'll yeah. be it'll it's gonna be the next social channel. It's good because the pendulum's gonna switch. Yeah, it's. Just, I mean, just like that. Uh, was it Be Real? 
was like one mm-hmm. of the like most like kind of hip and popular apps over the last year. And it's it's because people are craving authenticity. At the craving. end of the day, they want authenticity. They want to show you that in themselves. And they want brands that listen, not brands that spam. Like that's the thing is when people talk to me about social media, I'm like, don't be that annoying guy in front of the room that talks about himself the whole party and nobody wants to listen. Like you need to be social. And that's why, again, that's why the AI stuff, I don't want to say it bugs me, but it's like when it attempts to replace humans all together. And when I think it's deceptive, like I think mm-hmm. AI influencers without being marked as this isn't like a fake influencer art because they look real and it's scary. Oh, I think that brand. So this is an interesting topic because if you want to be a brand in the future, do the things that no one else is willing to do, which is what I agree. Like, like you got to be willing to lean into doing something that, that if you want to stand out. And one of those things is like put more humans instead of just trying to do automated email messages. Cause we all can tell they're automated. Yep. Are you actually opening them and believing that that's building trust with your client? But regardless of that, it's like looking ahead with AI. What does that say about your brand when you're when you're not actually building trust? Like mm. to me, what is that saying about your brand? Like that I I just I don't know where this goes. Like I have I believe that like it's I don't I'm not so against AI. It's that I'm I'm a little bit concerned about brands leaning so far into it that they lose their ability to rationalize how they like how do they come back from that? Does, I, I, does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah. I think it's just like, a complete the the thing that's funny is I remember and I'm going to date myself here, but I remember I was in college and everything I learned was traditional media. It was print ads, it was billboards, and it was like, that was the thing. Facebook was a, we just came out with like, it was on all of the college campuses now, but nobody ever thought that the implications of that would be advertising, posting for businesses. Like that wasn't even in the the ecosphere. For me, like the big thing is as a marketer, you just have to be agile because everything that I've learned about digital marketing, I've taught myself, it was post-college. I wasn't going to get a degree in like digital advertising. Why bother? You know what I mean? I it's easy enough to teach yourself with all the resources we have. I think from a brand perspective, though, the thing is, like, we talked about this earlier, it's chasing the zigzags. It's, oh, meta, all of a sudden, I need like a meta store, and I need X, Y, and Z, and oh, oh, AI, I need to do this, and I can replace my copywriter. It's less like, I think if the people that are going to win, and the people that are going to continue to have loyal customers are the ones that aren't just going to chase after the fad, they're going to use it for fun. Like, do you remember the, was it a McDonald's ad that did chat GPT comparisons of Burger King and McDonald's, um, the Big Mac and the Whopper. It. And it was on like, they put it on like Subway, um, the little like uh, Subway covers or whatever. And people loved it because it was hysterical. It was like computer automation, just talking about both of them and which one was better. I think it, I typed into chat GPT, which one is better. But those people that are like, again, using creativity to bring it back to, this is funny. People don't know where it's going, but like, we're going to poke fun at it. We're not just going to lean a hundred percent into it blindly and hope to God that it's going to save us money. We'll be at the front of the pack because nobody knows where this is going, you know? So I think this is going to be a new module of guidance for brand strategists is, you know, I don't know how to describe it because it's new. No one's really covered this ground. It's like new, but it's like the way I would describe it in my brain is, you know, your brand values, if your brand values are about empathy, like think of a, if you want to really create empathy, like what you're describing of going in and meeting the defected clients, that's about getting a level of empathy for what they went through and, and communicating to the brand to be able to have them to be, you know, meeting, shoring up their 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 needs. And if you think about your brand strategy and going like, where does AI end and where do the humans begin? And what's our philosophy on it? And where we it? Because I think what I was talking about before about you, where you come back to that, if you kind of are creating a bunch of stuff with AI, including your voice and your, and, or even if your personal brand and you're doing all this stuff, I can tell when people are using AI now yep. and I'm just sort of like, you're kind of mailing it in. And, and you know what? Now I've shut off. It's quiet quitting in your brain. It's, that's what I think is going to happen is people quietly, you don't even realize that you're not even, you're, the level of attention was already hard to get. Mm. Now it's going to be hard to come back if you've lost it. I don't think people will trust they go, yeah. So I think that when you see 100% human generated and things of that nature, you're anticipating where people are at. And then maybe it's sort of like what I wrote in my book, because at the time it wasn't about AI, but it's 
leverage AI, don't rely on it and use it to create more human interaction. Um, because I think that's a differentiator. People are craving it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, I'll use an example, which is funny. It's one of your, uh, old podcast guests, Jay. Um, which I one? signed up, uh, Jay Akunzo. I'm probably. Oh yeah. 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 Jay Akunzo. Yeah. Um, so I signed up, I listened to your podcast. I was like, wow, like I love this signed up for his email newsletter. And I, he wrote, like, I got an automation back and it was like, you can ask me any question. I respond to this. And I, I asked him a question thinking in my head, like maybe three weeks later, I'll get like some kind of like automated, like whatever. And he wrote me this awesome, really thoughtful response. And I remember being like, wow, because again, automation is there because it was used to reply to me with like, hey, here's everything about my brand and what I do and what I believe. But he's still on the back end of that. And that made me like literally went out and bought his book next. I was like, okay, like I'm I'm signing up for what he's selling type thing. So massive um, alignment with Jay. He's on the same boat. It's like, go ahead, do more automation, do more AI, have at it. The people that are, we're working with are going to have a massive differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like we talked about authenticity, like that's one of my core values. That's why like, again, AI is fun for me to like uh, get, um, if I'm thinking about like creative headlines or what would I call this product? I'll type in and I'll get some ideas, but I'll never just kind of blanket use them. I'm like, oh, this is an interesting word. Let me play around with this. So again, there are awesome implications for it. I think it can be like, there's a lot of great use for it, but I remember even this was years ago. I had my project as an intern was to explore Second Life. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Which was essentially the metaverse. And so it's funny because that was such a big thing then that I, at the time, the agency I was working for, they're like, this is going to be where we put all our investment and what's going to set us apart. And now it's like, it never really took off, but now the metaverse is about to be that thing. And I see like Wendy's creating their like a metaverse store and all of this. And it's, you got to wonder, like, again, they have huge marketing budgets, but you got to wonder where it's all going. But a part of this is going to be just like it was when Facebook, you know what I mean, kind of came out and businesses were allowed to post and everyone was figuring it out. And what do you post and what do you say and what's effective? Like we just, we learn and we grow. And I do think though that the human element and that really essential piece of creativity is always going to have to be there. And I don't think that can ever be AI generated. The, the only thing about AI that's different from anything else is I think there was Two, invention, the, two inventions in the planet of all time that changed everything. Discovering fire and AI. It's kind of that. I, I really yeah. think it's that kind of like we're at the, we're at the beginning of something we have never seen that's going to change everything. And, um, and I don't mean to be ominous. It's got a great tool. It's got kind of great potential. It's, it's that I believe that, um, you know, it's like automation and it's a little bit like this. Um, if you're, if I'm working with a brand, some the founder and, and they're, and they're going, well, you've got this, you do the design and, and they're and as you've probably done this before, where they just kind of want to hand the keys to you. And you're like, uh, for me, I don't want that. I want them to have their fingerprints in it yeah. because they'll embody the brand. And ultimately the goal is to actually have it not just like, that's a great document. It's to, it's that it's embodied. Mm. And so as brands go forward with, uh, with AI, it's going to have such a pervasive lure, it's seduction of doing all these things like copywriting, like, oh, let's get our AI to create our brand guide or whatever, right? And, and it's a little bit like, I'm going to get the AI to work out for me to lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> right? If only. And, <laughs> if only, right? And, and so part of the journey of business, if business is, if the brand you're creating is just about a transaction, then do the automation. Use be like a vending machine. Who fucking cares? Like, do whatever you're gonna do. Yeah. But I believe that the people you and I are talking about are looking about becoming remarkable. There's a hint mm. of artist in them and a, and a human centric thinking that they want to make a difference, something of meaning, and something they're proud of, and that has human connection. Then I think you're talking our language, and I think that that it's like knowing how to utilize it without affecting your brand possibility and that's the kind of where i'm sitting with this as it's getting clearer to me as we kind of see this it's going to get more clear as time goes on but what's your take on on that piece there because handing the keys to ai and it's not that i'm trying to protect my job or or whatever that that at all if it's not it's there's a transformation that exists tell me if i don't know what your experience but for me the transformation exists when the ownership team embodies the brand 
because they then meet in the people in the company go and there's a, a human connection but that's not us this is what we do this is how we are not this is what the ai said we should do yeah because it's born out of the ownership the leadership it's the epicenter of the storm going to the groundswell right yep I think it's, um, I've been, I think about this a lot of the two, two big questions of leadership and legacy within businesses. One of the questions I usually like to ask business owners is what would your brand tombstone say? Because that to me is like alluding That's to a like. Great question. I love that one. <laughs> like oh my God, I'm stealing five. that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I think I got that from a, from a book marketing to mind states or something like that, but I loved it. Cause I was like, it oh gives God. you the question of legacy and that's really important of what do you want to leave behind? Because I've talked to business owners who are like, I'm just here to make money and respect at the end of the day, we all are, but a people see through that B there's no, like there's no purpose behind what you're doing and people are going to see through it very quickly. Um, and people aren't going to find a reason to buy from you. Like that's why our, I think like the millennial generation and definitely Gen Z is so purpose driven with their marketing where it's shifted so much. It's no longer the, I am a business. I made a product. People will buy it. People are no longer like grateful for the chance to buy from you. They want to know why. And they have, by the way, countless options. So the, again, if you talk about wanting to build a sustainable long-term business, a hundred percent agree, you're not going to buy that by trying to cut corners. At the end of the day, if we're selling to human beings, if we're selling to robots, it's different. But if we're selling to human beings, there needs to be human connection. That is what people relate to. We already know that people buy into stories and purpose and what this says about them. Like at the end of the day, and the thing I think that makes me the most crazy is everybody, you know, from a brand perspective, they want to be center stage. And like you are supporting character energy in someone else's main story, right? Like you are not like the be all end all that they revolve around. You're something that they utilize as part of their lives to make it better, more joyful, easier, et cetera. And if you really care about your customers and you care about your people, that reflects everywhere, I think at least. And it's not the, those aren't the kind of businesses that are like, how do we cut corners? Those are the kind of businesses that actually go the opposite direction or like everyone's running this way. We're going to keep going the opposite way and say, how do I lean in more to human connection how can I unautomate like some of my services, right? Like how do I be more human in this world that is telling us everything can be done cheaper, faster, better, easier? Like it's a, uh, it's a race to the I think you just gave bottom. me the title of a co-authored article I want to write with you. How, yeah. to un how to unautomate. Yes. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> Seriously. Like, I mean, I, I, you just, that's like, I love that. I mean, it's like, because you're like, that's true. And like unbundle, the nonsense because you don't even realize. So what happens is brands don't even, there's like a, unless somebody like nobody's going to go to you go, Hey, that automated email was, it's like, I'm, I'm defective because like no one's going to say that. Yeah. And so what happens is, is all these embedded processes that we create that are, and usually sometimes that happens in, bu in business process with employees where they go, Hey, we don't give out refills as an example, that's a policy. And then the client comes and goes, Oh, I spilled my drink. I'm sorry. You know, we don't do refills or something. When there's no, like at the at the forefront of your brand, is that really what you want the experience to be? Or yep. maybe you go, hey, that's, it's like, we, we limit it to one refill or use your judgment or you can make a call there as the employee, we trust you or whatever. It's different than these policies that sometimes what they do is they don't realize they're actually paper cuts that, uh, you know, killing their, their audience, their, their, mm -hmm. their brand value, you know? Yep. I think automation is one of those paper cuts you just don't even know. Yep. And you won't know until probably yeah. far too late. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think the one thing that I just like really am like focused on right now is just, I mean, I call it the like the human part of business and just like everyone is looking around at like what's easy and what's the answer for marketing. And I joke and I'm like, you ask five marketing strategists, a question, they'll give you five different answers. And it's true because we all have our unique way of tackling problems, of thinking about things. But that's why marketing is fun. Like that's why this is a cool business to work in. And um, if you kind of focus all your efforts and attention on like chasing down the shiny objects, you'll be exhausted. But if you focus on like, this is what I know works, this is the kind of, you know, companies and businesses and brands that I want to help build. 
Um, I really do think there's so much still here, opportunity for creativity and impact in people's lives. And that's why I love the business. I have to go back to that. Yeah. I mean, when you're saying fun, right, someone's listening and they're going, marketing isn't fun. This is business. There's actually science behind fun. Fun is a higher level of energy. And, you know, and I 100 percent agree. If you if if you if you're if you're having fun marketing your business, you're moving in the right direction. If you're not having fun, you might ask yourself, why? Mm. Why are you not having fun? What about this isn't working? It's probably not congruent with your values. It's exhausting. You're there's there's a multitude of, of different reasons. I think it's an indication of of an unhealthy brand, quite honestly. Mm. And when you also said a, a minute ago uh, earlier, you were saying clients come to you to ask, what's the fastest way to do this? Or what's the easiest way, right? And I would go back to the workout. If I went to my my uh, uh, you know my 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 trainer and said, "What's the easiest way to work out? What's the fastest way to work out? Is that the right question, or is how can I lose my my twenty pounds? How can I have the healthiest workout with the least amount of time?" It's like it's not that things that are hard have to be hard or they have to be long in branding. It's just asking a more intelligent question about the resources yep. you have in the direction you're going and not speed isn't everything. I know that Jay Bear's got the great uh, book out now about speed, about speed matters. Uh, that's about response time. But in terms of some things you don't want to speed, which is what is the fastest way to figure out your brand is not one of the things you want to put on gas. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, even in that analogy of like losing 20 pounds, like if you think about it, a great trainer would say to you, instead of losing 20 pounds, like what about getting to the healthiest version of you? Cause that's the ultimate, again, sustainable goal that sets you up for health and energy and wellness long-term. Um, and again, I think so many brands are looking so short term right now and I get it. You have goals and re- like revenue that needs to be made and all of those things, right? Right. There's, you got to keep the wheels running. And I understand that. But if you're looking for longevity in your customer loyalty, like you can't just go the way, again, the, the zigzag of like, what about this? What about this? What about this? You're just burning time, money, energy, all of the things. And I joke with people, I'm like, this shit should be fun. If we're not having fun, we're doing something wrong. Because if you aren't excited to tell people about this amazing thing that you built or this company that you devote 40 hours of your week to, then what are we doing here? Like there should be an energy and an excitement around that. If you don't love it, how do you expect your clients to like it? Yes. Yes. People read that. They read the stale, the stagnant. It's so easy to pick up on that. Um, So yeah, it's like wanting to work with those brands that still have a pulse that... (laughs) That have that sense of fun and risk aversion, where they're, or sorry, like risk tolerance, where they're not going to be like, oh no, we've never done this before, and it's like, and that's why we need to try. Um, so yeah, that's that's the fun, that's the stuff that lights me up and makes me so really excited about this field because otherwise, it's hard, it's easy to get bogged down with AI and what's my ROI on every single thing, and you know, I didn't reach my goals this month. What did marketing do wrong? Like, it's not always marketing, but. You know, um, when you think about it as this collection of just this awesome, like, mix of the science and the art behind it, like, that to me is, like, gets me excited to wake up every day. Yeah, it's a Rubik's Cube. It's like a puzzle. I I love the trying to, the figure outable, you know, how to position yourself. And the challenge is, before you can do that, I think if you're listening and you're going, well, I need to find the expert, it's not that you're, it's actually not, I don't think that's where the start is. The start is, it's you the founder, are you willing to be brave? Like Mm. what you mentioned, are you willing to do the hard things? Are you going to be able to stomach the, what it takes to actually, do you think Patagonia when they had, when they were saying we're going to like the amount of decisions that they've made that go against like anyone that was on their board that wasn't bought into the values that they were espousing would have pulled their hair out and and today's market into these short term, you know, uh, quarter to quarter earnings they they would have said this makes no sense, but look at them now. Yep. Right? It's like so true. They, I mean, they don't even open in some of the busiest days in the holidays. They <laughs> shut it down. They do they're they're going the other direction. Yep. I love what, that. Me too. And it's like, and I think that what that takes, it takes a certain metal. Mm. It's like, do you got if you look at the best brands, they had a level of metal and bravery, and are you up for it? If yeah. you're not, 
then go with everyone else. Yep. A hundred percent. That's what, uh, again, everybody says they want to be Apple or Amazon or Tesla or Patagonia. And again, those decisions and the things that they've done to get to the top. I mean, I, I heard somewhere, I think it was like Amazon operated at a loss for like the first 10 years of like millions of dollars. Um, and I was fascinated by that because I was like, how did they keep going not having many revenue and operating at a loss all those years? And now look what he's built. Like, but again, So why do you think it is? Uh, resilience. Him. And he believed, he believed in himself. He was like, this I, is going to work. I believe it was worth it. I, yeah. I know, I, you know, yep. the, the treasure hunt, the three things, that's exactly what it was. And he, he can, he was an immovable object on his values and the out, epic outcome that he was trying to create. And he was yeah. clear and congruent with it. And he kept moving that direction. And frankly, he was really smart. He, he did the base like beachhead strategy for branding, started with books and kind of expanded on it and showed momentum of purchasing, but profitability he must have been able to some map profitably. I don't know the whole story about that, but he must have had some horizon. But not everybody can go that long without cash flow. And so I think most people listening, they're like, there's no way I could go 10 days without cash flow. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. mean that you have to go and starve and and whatever. I, I think what it is is just the idea of being sticking to your values and following through. Yeah. You know? And then finding that success, but like again, not right away. I think everyone is like, I do X, I get Y. And that's not true, especially in marketing. It's not true. And those things degrade over time. Some of the things that worked before don't work two, three months down the line, two, three years down the line. Um, but yeah, that's why, again, that's to me, same as you, I love puzzles. And it's it's a fun puzzle to solve always. And again, it's always if you're rooted in your values and you're willing to kind of uh, see it through, um, I do believe there are awesome results in that horizon. You know, I've been, I've been, you know, working with Tony Robbins for like almost six years now. And he's not, I mean, he's not known, like most people think of him as like a professional development or something. He's not known for, for branding and marketing strategy. And yet he is a brilliant guy in that direction. I mean, if you, once you understand what he really is, the guy has just, you know, just absolutely been a student in every direction. And one of the things that he says is, you know, he goes, what is, ask yourself this question. Like you, you're, what business are you in? And you'll say something. No, what business are you really in? What business are you really in? You know, are you really in the, like, if you think the, the, are you in the business of, of selling chocolate bars or are you really in the business of giving people moments of happiness? You know, it's like, what, what, what business are you really in? And then what business do you need to be in? And this to me, we're talking about AI and we're talking about brand strategy and direction. I think those three powerful questions can redirect, um, you know, your thinking around it and getting out of the conventional way of thinking. And, and I, you know, curious what you think of those three questions, or if you have something similar to that, the ask clients. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I love the analogy. Someone said this uh, before Uber wasn't a rideshare service. It was a convenience service because what it actually offered, like there were, there were two different things. So a hundred percent. And I, one of the things that I do ask my clients is what are we really selling? Um, so very similar of, you know, for example, I worked with an interior designer and she was like, well, I sell, you know, I sell things that make their home look nice. And I like, we kind of like laddered that down into, it was sanctuary. The thing that everyone was looking for was their place of peace. Um, so again, it's like the more that you kind of like dig, dig deep, um, there are really great opportunities within that. Again, it's because it's tapping into the message, A, that no one else is from a positioning standpoint. But at the same time, too, it's allowing you to better understand yourself and your customers. So, yes, those questions are so very, very important. And, like, I love those little thought experiments and exercises. I think they're so helpful for brands. You know, uh, earlier you had mentioned about how consumer behavior has changed. You know, you're a student of consumer behavior. I can see that really clearly with all the research and stuff that you do. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you, what you think of this expanding on a little bit. You mentioned about how millennials, they no longer want to buy, like I'm pulling up my phone, this phone based on price and the product and placement. They want to know what's behind it. What's the purpose? What, what are you doing with the money? Are you, are you actually sourcing from, you know, slave labor somewhere? Like all those things start to matter. And that's why I read about my book, The Groundswell, right? Which is, building brands that actually create meaning, but more purpose that transform the world. And, you know, transformation, I think the transformation economy is what we're moving into where people no longer want travel. They want to be transformed. 
when they come back, that they're, they're not the same person. They're not just went, got a vacation for their life. They actually changed their life and, and not even just changed their life. They're, they're not the same. And I think of the Uber example you gave, there used to be cabs and they transformed that industry to Uber. And when you're when you transform in your brand design, the way that people experience your brand in a way that they'll never be the same. I bet you every single person that used Uber to their friends that never heard about it, you were compelled to tell them, never order a cab again. You got to try Uber. That is where this growth loop of transformational design and brand design is. And it requires metal. It requires planning. It requires building a deeper purpose. It's building a groundswell. That's actually, you know, my, what my book's about. I, I was curious what, when you got to that point about talking about transformational design and branding, what, where did you land in that? And what could you add to it? I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. I mean, I think that the Uber example is a great one because again, it was like taking something that was an immovable object, which is, and even as they were building, it was crazy what they went through with like the local um, kind of like taxi cab authorities and transportation authorities and everything. But when they were able to do something though, that what's what's kind of funny and like the lesson I feel like to be learned there, taxi cab companies were awful, at least where I was in like Philadelphia. Oh my I God, hated brutal. taxi cabs. Yes. I dreaded fucking cabs. <laughs> they were gross inside. They, if you scheduled them, they never showed up on time. There were people that just refused to take me. Like I remember trying to leave Phillies games and people would be like, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. And I'd be terrified. I couldn't get home. So what they did is they recognized the gap in people need to get places quickly, easily, and affordably. And they want to be able, like, they made it that shareable experience because they allowed you to give and, you know what I mean? Like make it more of like a social thing where it was all within an app and it was all within your phone. And I think that was really the forefront. Like you said, when you're talking about transformational design, it was so much easier than having to find the cab number, call them, hope they answered all of this. You didn't have to talk to anybody. It was frictionless. So that user experience was so much easier. So one of the things just like consumer behavior wise is that there was a ton of companies outside of Uber, kind of that I think was like one of the first dominoes, but that were all about convenience. Amazon is another example. Like a lot of things targeted towards millennial were very, millennials were very convenience driven. HelloFresh, Instacart, all of these really great big brands. I think what's happening now with Gen Z is asking for more than convenience. It's asking for responsibility, which I think is really interesting. And it's there are some companies like Patagonia that have led the forefront of that. But like you said, when you buy an Uber, when you get Instacart, like what is that doing for the greater good? Um, so I think what's really interesting is we're asking for more than ever from the companies we buy from because we realize the bargaining power that we have. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's important is it's no longer enough to do your bare minimum. And the companies that are great realize that and can like, again, the Amazon example, like now they're getting into um, prescription medications and things like that to make that easier and more accessible to people. Like it fits in line with this vision, right, that he has for the company. And you can see where it all kind of matches up. Um, but like you said, people, when they're buying an iPhone, they want to know that there's some kind of sustainability purpose behind it. And now all of these companies are scrambling to find those statements when in reality, the ones that win are the Patagonias and everything like that, that have already baked that in so long ago. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting for people, especially from like higher generations, when you talk to them about purpose, there tends to be at least what I found a lot of resistance because why does that matter? And I'm like, you don't understand the people that are buying your product care a lot. And they're weighing you against other options. So you have, again, the rapid success of like Warby Parker and Tom's and all of these brands that were like, get one, give one. Is it Bumba's, the sock brand um, that donates a pair of socks to the homeless, every single pair they sell? Like people love feeling like they're co-creating and experiencing a product or service with you. Um, because again, it's I'm doing good by buying this. So I'll pay an extra couple of dollars for X, Y, and Z product because I know that I'm helping. That's, I feel like what people, uh, I do think that's something that's going to continue. And I do think it's going to be an added pressure on brands that don't have anything like that in place quite yet. So well said, you know, the, what you're referring to is leader brands and the, the latter of brands, a lot of people think when we're talking about like sort of these creative brands, that's a craft brand where it's a small brand niche market. Then there's the um, disruptor brand that's like, you know, that's where Uber is. Then there's the challenging brand, which would have been Lyft that challenged Uber, right? And then there's a leader brand, right? And what you're talking about, you said something so powerful. 
responsibility. The leading brands take responsibility. They own it. They take responsibility for the category. They take responsibility for every aspect. And that's what people now are requiring deeper responsibility in every aspect of their business. Thanks to thanks to transparency and, and the internet and stuff, it's no longer it's no it's no longer nice to have. I think it's table stakes. You have to have it or you're gonna compete. And that mm. comes down to trust. It's because people want a deeper level of trust. And I think you just I I never used I never thought of it that way, but thank you. Responsibility, that's totally awesome. Sustainability and responsibility, that is the 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 hallmark of a leader brand for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I hope too, I mean, there is a sense when I work with people, I like that there are there's a higher level purpose that at the end of the day they want to make the world a better place. Because I think for a while when I was kind of working in corporate marketing and agency environments, I would have those crises of conscious of like, what am I doing with my life? Like I'm spending all of this time, especially when I'm sure you get this when I was coming up and working at agencies, they pay next to nothing. I was barely paying my bills. And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? And I remember thinking like, I want to help people. I want to make the world a better place. And I firmly believe that brands have the opportunity and ability to do that. Um, I think that it's more of a push now because it used to be all just consumerist culture of just buy, buy, buy. Again, like top down, I have a product, you buy it. Now it's consumers want to be a part of that that reflects things that are important to them that makes a change for the better. And that's actually something so powerful that makes marketing a really awesome tool for doing great things in this world. Because again, the amount of money that like an Amazon makes in profit and the amount of money that they're able to kind of donate and give back and all of that, right? Like those are the things I think that have the ability to really change things for the better, we hope. So I'm all about it. I mean, like a building a brand that can make a difference and building a grounds hole for good. And and I agree. I mean, it's the responsibility of businesses. And I think the cultural field and where we're going as a, as a, as the world is the, you know, there's, I, I think there's always a role for nonprofits, but there's something that starts that whole, the energy of it, nonprofit. It's, it, you know what I mean? Like, I think that you're going to see nonprofits are going to go by the wayside. I think that the responsibility is going to go to corporations and businesses mm. and brands and individual brands that integrate social responsibility into what they do in every fabric so that it creates more meaning in their lives, more fulfillment. Tony says this great quote, you know, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Mm, and that. that is what I believe um, leader brands and what you're talking about is, is you're creating fulfillment. That's why I love the tombstone. That's about fulfillment. Beautiful. Yeah. And I also, um, when I do marketing planning, I put giving back as a part of like awareness. And when I talk about that, I'm like, it's a double-edged sword of great stuff because if you do it right, you're going to get some awesome recognition and people are going to see how you align with your purpose. And you're also doing something awesome. That's helping your local community X, like whatever matters to your consumers, all of that. So like, it's something that I try to really push upon customers that I'm working with. Cause it's like, I know you want to do X and this is what you want to like impact. And along the way, there are so many opportunities, even my, my own business. I've tried to be a steward of this, of like, I set up a scholarship fund. Um, I do uh, entrepreneurial classes that I teach to eighth grade down here. Um, and it's for me, that's the stuff that's really fun because it's, it feels good to be able to give that back um, and be able to teach something that I really love and enjoy. So I got a slight challenge for you to do on the fly right now. Yeah. Right. Oh God. I'm All nervous. Right. Don't be nervous. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm in agreement with what you're saying. And there's the saying, right? Give back. And to me, there's a certain energy of it that I think has this feeling. It's almost like throw a piece of raw meat behind you or tipping the waiter. It's like, it doesn't have the right give back just has this like, 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 Oh, I better give back. You know, it's like, and there's, it's going backwards or something. I wonder if we could rebrand what give back is. What's the new give back? Is it give forward? Is it like, what can we, how can we reframe this? Because I think as you, my, my book, right? Give is a new get. It is this, it is the single biggest competitive advantage. If you lean into give in such a way. And if, by the way, when you think you're giving, this is for anyone that's listening, you know, I, this is my little PSA about give. If you think you're giving, like you're going to give a free ebook and they're going to get to get their email. That's not a give. Give has got to feel like, oh my gosh, I should be charging. This It should not hurt in a negative way. It should feel like a significant investment that you know deep in your heart that it is a give. Mm. You're you're really like it taking a piece of you and, and going, this is, 
you know, it could be an emotional, it could be financial, it could be whatever it is that give. And I think that that is what is a distinctive differentiator between what's going to become a remarkable brand. What can we change the word give back for companies and brand it? Maybe you and I come up with a brand we have of because I think that marketing from a brand level and getting people bought in because give back, they go, yeah, I know I'm supposed to. It's sort of like your energy drops to like, okay, yeah. you know, I'll do it. Right. Like what, what can we do that would be more energizing? I do love give forward. When you said I was actually thinking the same, but like, and this isn't it, but something to me was like cycle of giving. Cause like it does, like you said, when you put that out into the world, like it does tend to come back. There's like the, the ripples and the implications over time. So there's something cyclical about it that I think that's really Ooh, I interesting like that. too. But. I love cycles and it's like, it, that way it's not just, I give back like it's a one-time tip. It becomes yeah. part of it. You know, it's like a, the gives ecosystem or something, you know, we'll have to, yeah. like, but, but is that going to, is that can inspire an executive to really find, but I like the give, you know, cycle or something like something like that. Like, I think there's maybe it's not something we can do on a podcast live is kind of putting you on the spot and me on the spot for doing it. But, but that's something that's a, a little bit of a brain tickler of like, an example of like branding on the, like thinking about even the words you use, the the, the specificity of it can change the way the energy, the reception mm. and the use of it and the strategic level. It's not just words. Yeah. When people go, oh, you're just changing words. It matters. Yep. It's funny. The dog, every... the dog bit Johnny or Johnny bit the dog. The sequence of matter matters, especially if you're Johnny. Yes. A hundred percent. And it's funny because the people sometimes that have pushed back and they're like, well, you know, budgets are tight is usually the first thing I hear. But every time that one of those initiatives has been carried out, it's not the press. It's not any of that. It's the actual people that like the impact happens. And they're like that feeling of just being like, oh, I actually moved something because in business, sometimes it's like, you know, we're selling hot dogs or t-shirts or whatever we're doing and you get in your day to day. But when you're actually able to help, especially some of my businesses that are like small community based businesses, like that's the stuff to me, that's just awesome. Because then you're seeing how you can use your business, not just in a way to sustain your lifestyle, but in a way to actually make your community better, make the world better. Like, and that I believe is something that is like, the top, like when we were talking about purpose and legacy, like those are the things that people are going to want to be remembered by. Maybe it's integrate giving. Yeah. You know? I like but, that. But, and, but if I, if I think about it, I'm the owner and then I'm going, when I say the word giving, I'm thinking of a, a ledger, right? I'm trying to put my, be empathetic to the, the owner, right? The CFO yeah. he's going, Oh fuck, that's a negative in the ledger. Right. Yeah. How, like, so maybe it's integrate profitable giving because, the connection that I'm trying to make in my book and on this podcast and these conversations are, it's actually profitable. It mm. actually accelerates growth. Like we are missing. That's the whole point of the give back and all that energy and language is it's, it's like you're, you're being sold the wrong bill of goods. This actually is now, it used to be like nice to have like greenwashing your business. Now it's going to be a competitive advantage and it's, and actually it has done right. It can actually accelerate your business. So yeah. I was thinking about like, that's what I'm trying to figure out is like maybe come up with like, what did you call it? it? Was like integrate cyclical giving or some profitable giving or something? I don't have to think about that. Yeah, I'm um, also thinking too because the idea of like give is like you actually, if you do it right, you get as well. Um, so it could be getting back, like getting back to your roots, getting back to the thing and the purpose of why you started your business, um, and ultimately in getting this process, back. Yeah, I like that. That could be that's because give is the new play. get. Yeah, yeah, that could be kind of fun. Because it is. That's really what we'll it is. Like you getting back. I love it. That would be. I think that's. It. I think we just nailed it. This. It's about getting back. Yeah. It's like getting back to our human roots. It's getting back to. It's also you're getting it back. Like, it just. It's you know. It's. It, I think that's the. There's an, also an invisible ledger. That invisible ledger is what a brand is. It's. It's like it doesn't always show up on the balance sheet. Always. Mm. It can show up in different ways of how your your employees feel about work yeah it's not always the customer it's like what does your culture feel like like think of the people now that were working that you know i think i saw some stat that millennials now they'll take a job that a less money if they know the company is doing some good in the world yep and i think too the with kind of the uh what do they call it the great resignation a lot Quiet of people resignation just- yeah yeah, a lot of people just got tired of being like, I'm tired of making someone else rich. 
or this isn't like paycheck isn't enough for me. Again, it's like the, the sense is that there are more options than ever. I can make money another way. Um, and for me, it's more about what am I putting my life's energy into? They want something, like you said, what's the culture? They want something that in the day they're like, I feel great about my life because I did this. This is the impact I was able to have because of this company. And if they don't find that, they'll go get it themselves. Yeah, the quiet quitting thing, I have a couple different point of views on that. One is if their intention and they can work and do what they want to do at more valuable, then more power to them. But if you're staying and you're not actually doing the work and you're quietly just like not you're you're not doing your work and then you're gonna kind of quietly quit. I think that that's actually a form of stealing. You know, mm. you're not it just if you're gonna quit, quit. You know, quit yeah. on principle, whatever it is, right? Um, and I don't think that's what you're saying. You were saying, you know, just people just leaving because they want to uh, leave, do something better. I think that's exactly right. But there's also another aspect, which is I wonder how much of people actually want to move and move in purpose. Those are my people. They want to, they want to, they're, they're driven by purpose, but yet I unfortunately lumped in that, that makes it really a cloudy mess. When we talk about this topic, there's a ton that just want to hand out. And yes. that's the unfortunate thing is like the cloudiness of people wanting a handout and they, as people assuming that we're talking about giving is like a handout. And we're not talking about that, you know, and I just want to, if someone's listening, that's not what we're saying at all. There's a really clean line for me in that mind set of, of where that line is um, because I'm a pro entrepreneur. I'm a pro advocate of the owners of them becoming profitable. I'm their advocate. Like I'm in their corner. You know, they work hard every day. They're gladiators, man. They go put their life on the line. And if they don't succeed, they, they get wiped out. They don't have yeah. any guarantees, you know, so I'm really in their corner. I get it, you know, but, but I think that they also need to open their eyes to that things are changing massively. A hundred percent. I mean, I yeah. think if it's a checkbox, then it's not for you. Like if, if getting back or giving back, however we want to call it is one of getting those things back, where it's yeah. like, yeah, it's like, man, I just, we really need to do something. Where are we going to put this money? Then don't do it. But if it's something that's really aligned within your heart and something that you feel is like, just again, align with your business, who you are, your values, all of that, then that to me is one of the best gifts that you can give. Um, I do this. Uh, I'm a big Australian shepherd fanatic. I have an Aussie. I and saw I, uh, your dog on your website. <laughs> absolutely she, cute. She is absolutely insane, like complete train wreck, but I love her so much. But um, I started fostering Australian shepherds. It started as the question of like, how many Aussies is too many Aussies? The answer is two. Um, but doing it rips your heart apart a little bit because you have this animal with you for like a couple of months and you fall in love with them. But the thing that kind of brought me back is like, I've been able to help these animals have a better life. Like they've been abused, they've been abandoned. And now they're in a position where like I get pictures with their foster families where they're on boats or at national parks or like, you know, just like live in the dream. And that's the thing that, again, it's like, it was at both times, like four to five months of utter chaos in my house, just Aussie hair everywhere, like drooling sick dogs, like cooking chicken and rice every night, like all of the stuff that like you think of and all of the time drain and energy suck and everything. But I look at the outcome and I'm like, that's the stuff that makes it feel a authentic to me, but be just really good that when I think about it, it just lights me up and makes me happy. I could go on forever about dogs. What's her name? That's What's another story. Name? Uh, Buffy. I'm Buffy. a big Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. Oh, she named <laughs> yeah. after a character. It's funny because we have Chaka. She's a, a Brussels griffin. And um, did you ever see the movie Land of the Lost with uh, no. Will Ferrell? He was like a remake of the old Land with Lost series. And there's this like little uh, monkey thing that's like really annoying uh, Will Ferrell. And he's like, and he's like, Chaka. And it's like, and then me and my kids are watching. We're like, oh, if we get a dog again, we're going to name it Chaka. Because it's like, and we laughed and we ended up naming our dog Chaka. And, uh, She's a little bit like the character. She's this little monkey dog. She's pretty funny. So, Yep. They bring joy to the day. You know, they remind you not to take it all so serious. <laughs> and that's, and that, I think that's the, you know, I'll just end on that note. It's like branding doesn't have to be this. I, we, we take it seriously, but I think that when you, when you don't take life too seriously and you show up and, and build a business, use, do the research, do all the stuff, but it's like, have this, some lightheartedness to it. It's, you really can go into some really incredibly new places with your brand. And I think that's what you, you kind of like play in both fields, the artist in you and this analytic and, and researcher side of you. It's, it's a really great to see. Thank you for awesome. being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. 
Awesome. And where, so just real quick, where can people follow and find you? Sure. I am uh, only on LinkedIn. So my name is Sunny and my last name is Dublick, D-U-B-L-I-C-K. And then my website, sunnydublick.com. Beautiful. And if um, you're listening and you want to, you know, drop me a voicemail, go to groundswell.fm, click on the mic and leave me a voicemail. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. If you want to leave me a message about this episode or things that you want to hear, I want to hear from you. Um, groundswellinacircle.com is our community. If you want to join the community the conversation, love to hear you there. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening. Until next time, mahalo. 